So last time we explored some basic models for silicon. We first talked about the bonding model. So we've got a bunch of silicon atoms in a lattice and they're double bonded to each other. And we said that if one of these electrons has enough energy, it can choose to break this bond or it will break this bond and become a free electron in the solid. And what's left behind is what we called a hole. So it's a positive charge carrier hole or H plus as it's commonly abbreviated. So the hole is a positive charge carrier that we're gonna treat very similarly to the electron. Uh, and we drew the analogy of a bubble in water. So in reality, a bubble is nothing but empty space, just like a hole is nothing but an empty state left by an electron. But we don't describe bubbles in terms of all the water constantly flowing in uh, or falling into the bubble to make the bubble move upwards. We just say that, well, the bubble is clearly just moving up. And similarly, the hole can just move around. And we said that this model could be, you could also look at it as if you had two energy levels. So we call them the conduction band and the valence band. And if electron has enough energy, it will jump uh, from the valence band to the conduction band and it will leave behind a hole. And then each of these can then move around as it so pleases in their respective, uh, in their respective energy bands. And it might seem a little strange that I'm introducing this uh, energy band model uh, almost unnecessarily, but this is just more of a precursor to something that's uh, a, a model that will become much more powerful and will turn out to allow us to make really interesting predictions. Uh, but these basic models, like the, this basic bonding model has a couple of major issues. The first being that uh, we have no idea how to deal with the hole. Uh, so the electron, we might just say, well, why don't we just say that it follows Newton's laws and when we apply an electric field to it, uh, it starts moving in the opposite direction, just as if a particle, it starts accelerating in, in the opposite direction, just like a particle would in free space. Uh, but we don't really know how to treat the hole. We could just say that, well, uh, Let's just say that when we apply an electric field, the hole has the same mass as an electron and it just moves in the direction of the electric field. And you could use that model, uh, but you'd come up with some predictions that aren't quite correct. Uh, and you'd, you wouldn't be able to make very many, uh, very many quantitative predictions about how the semiconductor would behave. So where do we look for a better model? Uh, because I've told you that this model is going to be inadequate for describing how semiconductors behave. Uh, so we can look to our first principles, uh, or we can go back to quantum mechanics. So remember, we the model we've been using for most of what we've derived so far, so the density of states, et cetera, is that we've got electron, an electron inside a box. So it can move around inside the box, however it so pleases, but it cannot escape the box. It's not allowed to leave. And from this, we got that energy turns out to be quantized. The wave number turns out to be quantized. We also got the density of states, G of E, from a rather complicated counting procedure, and or G of E, D, E, if you prefer. And so, Maybe we maybe if we use that model, uh, then we can we can say something about how the electrons and holes move around in the solid. But this model is going to fail us as well because we only accounted for the electron inside this box. We said we said nothing about the hole, and there's nothing in the predictions of the model that say anything about how holes might move or really what holes might be. Uh, so this model uh, is insufficient as well. Sad face, crying sad face. So we need to come up with a better model. And well, if we want a better model than this model, uh, we might just say, well, how do we improve this one? So what did we ignore in the last one that 
is actually really important. And it turns out that we neglected uh, all the atoms. So in reality, this block of silicon is made up of a bunch of atoms, and they all have positive charges associated with them. So we've got an atom here, an atom here, a bunch of atoms, and they've got a certain spacing between each other, uh, and they're arranged in sort of this three-dimensional structure, the silicon crystal structure, and we just completely ignored them. So we're going to add them back in, in this next model. And this is going to allow us to make predictions about how holes will behave, uh, I promise. So this will lead us to what's called the chronic penny model. And basically what we say is, well, uh, we have these periodic we're going to just treat this in one dimension first. So we've got these periodic atoms, and we've got an electron that's sort of floating around. And let's call this spacing A between the atoms. And the electron's just floating around, minding its own business. But when it gets close to one of these atoms, it'll start to be attracted to the atom. And in quantum mechanics, we say that an attraction uh, is better represented as a potential energy, U. So remember, in the Schrodinger equation, uh, we said that k squared turned out to be 2m e over h bar squared. Uh, but if we've got a potential energy function in there, then we need to correct it with e minus u. So that is our, that is our wave number of our electron. And so we know that we actually know the potential energy of an atom it goes like one over r squared. And that just comes from Coulomb's law, which says that the electric field goes like one over r squared. So the potential energy just goes like one over r. So as the electron gets closer and closer to the atom, the potential energy gets lower and lower and lower. And technically it becomes infinite as you approach the point of the atom. But in reality, the electron can only get so close before uh, the uncertainty principle kicks in and the electron no longer has a definite position near the atom. So this is this is the potential function u. So it's a function of the distance away from the atom. And if we want to simplify these this potential energy, uh, we can just use a simple square. So we say, okay, I know that in reality it's got this one over r look to it, but we're just going to say that these potential wells is what, what, what they're called. We're just going to say that they look like squares. So the electron, as it's moving around, uh, encounters some, let's say that it's initially at zero energy. It goes to some negative potential energy, say minus u naught, as it sort of falls into this, into this barrier. And this is the potential function that we are going to use uh, u of x. So if this is the x coordinate and this is the u coordinate or the energy coordinate, uh, no, I, th I think u is more appropriate here. Uh, so this is what we will use to describe or to plug into basically the Schrodinger equation. And then solving that, uh, just approximating these atoms as just finite potential wells, uh, so at the ends, the electron still can't escape the box, but inside the uh, inside the lattice, uh, the electron is encountering a bunch of bumps, and those bumps are just atoms. So if we plug this into the Schrodinger equation, we plug this u of x into k here, then we can get a quantum mechanical description for how these atoms are affecting the electron's movement. And it turns out this will allow us to predict the existence of the whole and to describe it mathematically. And so in the next video, I'm going to qualitatively describe uh, the chronic penny model. And it ultimately, this is all it comes from. The tricky part is just in solving the Schrodinger equation. And that's why it well, that's why people find it so intimidating, because it is difficult to solve in some cases. So this is sort of where everything comes from. And in the next video, I'm going to describe the chronic penny model and how we actually treat the whole.